but uh, uh, without further delay, I want to introduce Ruth Rogers. Uh, I, I guess Ruth and I have known each other for about uh, 14 years or so. We, we both were uh, uh, taught at uh, the former Brevard Community College, now uh, Eastern Florida State College, and uh, worked together there. And I was really happy uh, uh, when I uh, took over here as executive director to uh, get her manuscript for the book Reparation. And uh, uh, I was able to uh, distribute it to uh, an independent committee that reviewed it. And uh, we, I was really happy that we were able to publish it because I think it's a great book. Uh, it's, it, it was a little bit of a departure for the, the Florida Historical Society Press. Obviously, we publish nonfiction books, but we have ventured into publishing novels as well that have a tie to Florida history. And Reparation was a little bit different because it isn't uh, a, a novel that is based on actual events, but it's based on reality. It reflects uh, uh, what happened in Florida in, from the late 1940s up to the present, really, and, and looks at a unique relationship that uh, Ruth will be telling you about. But it's a powerful book, and I think uh, uh, offers, uh, can serve as a catalyst for a lot of important uh, discussions about uh, race relations in Florida at a time when that's really needed. And I, I don't have to uh, uh, recite the headlines for you uh, over the past year or so, but uh, so much is going on that, that is reigniting a lot of those discussions that a lot of us thought were, uh, were, were done with and over, and, and things that were resolved a long time ago uh, are, are uh, rearing their heads again these days, it seems. Uh, so I think it's an important novel in that respect as well. So. Uh, Ruth Rogers, as she'll tell you, uh, based this on a lot on her life. Uh, uh, she uh, is a native Floridian. She grew up in, in Madison County. I mentioned that she was, was a, a teacher. She's retired now from uh, Brevard Community College and is concentrating on her writing. And, uh, uh, but I don't want to tell you too much about the book because we have the author right here. So please welcome Ruth Rogers. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Okay, I'm glad to see so many people here t tonight. Um, since this is the Historical Society, I wanted to start with a little bit of history. I live in Titusville. I've lived in Titusville since 1966. Um, I moved down here uh, right after I graduated from college. In fact, I graduated from FSU on a Thursday afternoon and I started teaching in Titusville on Monday morning. Uh, so it was, and it was May, I guess, late April, no, late April. Uh, so it was the last six weeks of school. I was teaching at, uh, I got a job at Jackson Middle School that was then Jackson Junior High. Uh, there was a teacher there who was pregnant and didn't want to finish out the school year. So um, I, was, I went for an interview at, in Tallahassee at FSU and I was hired and, and they wanted me to start immediately. So as soon as I graduated, I was moving down here and starting. Um, but uh, I did grow up in Central Florida. I grew up in uh, North Florida in Madison, and I don't know how many of you know where Madison is. Um, okay, Leela knows, I know. Leela just told me she's from Lee, which is just down the road from Madison, just east of Madison. But uh, if you don't know, Madison is on Highway 90, and Highway 90 runs uh, all the way across North Florida from Jacksonville to Pensacola. Uh, and Madison is about halfway between Lake City and Tallahassee. It's uh, on 90, um, Madison is 56 miles east of Tallahassee. There's a sign there that says Tallahassee 56 miles. Uh, and it's about the same distance in the other east to Lake City. But um, Madison is a town, a little town, about 3,000 people. I looked up some population figures on their uh, town website just to give you. Um, the entire county has about 18,000 people, and that's in all of Madison County. So it's very rural, it's very agricultural. Um, it was when I grew up there, and it still is. It hasn't changed a whole lot. There aren't there aren't as many family farms now. The farms have been more consolidated and they've become fewer owners, but still the land is being farmed by bigger conglomerates and with more machinery than we had. Um, but um, Madison has two claims to fame. One is the home of Colin P. Kelly. Anybody know who Colin P. Kelly was? 
No, he was the first hero of World War II. Uh, he was a pilot, and right after Pearl Harbor, a few days after Pearl Harbor, he was flying a, a flying fortress, a bomber, and he, uh, they dropped a bomb on a Japanese ship, and, and sank the ship, but on their way back, they were hit by Japanese fire, and the ship, uh, the plane uh, tore apart, and he stayed at the controls so that his crew could parachute to safety. Uh, he was the last one to leave the plane, and unfortunately, his parachute did not open, and uh, he was killed, and he was the first American pilot killed in World War II. And there's a statue in Madison, uh, right across from the courthouse, uh, uh, for freedom statue for Colin P. Kelly. And the highway running from Madison to Pinetta is named Colin P. Kelly Highway. And our, the other claim to fame is that Greenville, which is just west of, Tal west of Madison, is the, home, the childhood home of Ray Charles. And everybody knows who Ray Charles is. Uh, but Ray Charles was born in Georgia, but his family moved to Greenville when he was just a baby. And he grew up there, and then he went to the school in St. Augustine for the blind and deaf. Um, but um, his home has just recently been restored, renovated, and now it is, uh, you can see it in Greenville. Um, so, so that's the uh, Madison's uh, claim to fame. I grew up uh, 10 miles north of Madison, in a little community called Pinetta, or near Pinetta, on a farm. And uh, Pinetta is about five miles from the Georgia border. So I am a Floridian, but not too far from Georgia. So um, we didn't have relatives that lived in Georgia. But my family, my ancestors came to Madison County in the 1800s, depending on which ancestor you trace back. but. Um, my maiden name was Everett, and my great-grandfather came to Madison County as a child during the Civil War, about 1860. But my mother was a Williams. The Williams came about 1840s, and my father's mother was a Gramling, and the Gramlings were in Madison County in the 1830s. Uh, so I go back a long way. My family goes back a long way uh, in Florida, and so we were... We were very proud to be Floridians because Florida, somehow Florida seemed more exciting than Georgia, and we had relatives in Georgia, but we were always happy to, that, to say that we were Floridians, uh, not Georgians. So, um, but my ancestors were pretty much all farmers. I come from a long line of farmers, and they came to Florida, I think, looking for farmland. Probably they were giving away land when they came, uh, the, uh, where they give away 160 acres uh, if you stay on it, build a house on it, and farm it. Uh, so they came um, in search of farmland and, and stayed there. Uh, I was born in 1944, um, so uh, that means I just turned 70 a couple of months ago. Um, so if you are a southerner, then you know what life was like in the 40s and the 50s. And that's what my book describes as growing up in that time. Segregation was the law of the land. And as a child, I never really questioned it. I didn't know any other way of life. We were very much isolated on the farm. And I didn't really see a lot of people. We went to church on Sunday. I went to school once I turned, got old enough. But the other children I went to school with were also farmers' children, and they were all the same culture that I was from. And uh, there, weren't, there weren't any outside influences. We didn't have a television until I was 13. Uh, my father bought our first TV. Uh, but um, everything was segregated. The uh, Schools were segregated, theaters were segregated, restaurants were segregated. There weren't any restaurants, there weren't any public bathroom facilities for black people. If you went in a store, blacks and whites shopped in the same store, but if the black person was going to buy something and a white person was going to buy something, the, the black person would always wait for the white person to come up and pur purchase, make the purchase before the black person could. And if, a, if they both approached at the same time, the storekeeper would always turn to the white person. 
And while that white person was making a purchase and the black person was waiting, if another white person came up with another purchase, then the black person kept waiting until it was clear and there, was, there weren't any whites there to make a purchase. Um, and I grew up that way. I, I didn't really, I didn't know any other way of life and, and that's just the way it was. Um, it was kind of strange the way segregation worked though in the South. Um, even though all these things were segregated, housing was not really segregated. Our closest neighbors were a black family. And when I say close, this was a farm, so they weren't that close. They were down the road a ways, a uh, quarter of a mile or so. But, but there were, blacks and whites lived, you know, mixed together, and we worked together. Uh, my father had a sharecropper. The, in the story, of those, if you've read the novel, um, the uh, story is about a sharecropping family. And uh, my father had a sharecropper, and he did have, he was married, and he had some children, but they were not, they were younger than I was. Uh, they weren't my age, so I never had a, a little playmate like Delia and Katie are in the book. But um, the family that lived, uh, the sharecropping family lived about a mile away, actually, on some land that we owned, but it wasn't in proximity to where we lived, because we had moved when my grandfather died, we had moved in with my grandmother, and then the house that we had vacated became the sharecropper's house. So it was a mile or so down the road. Uh, but the family that lived next to us, um, we knew, and we worked together. Um, we grew a lot of different crops, but the main crop that we grew was tobacco. And if you know anything about tobacco, uh, it's a very labor-intensive crop, and in the summertime when the tobacco gets ripe and it's time to start picking it, it takes a lot of people to, to gather the tobacco. It has to be picked and carried to the barn, and then it has to be t handed and tied onto sticks and put in the barn to cure. So it takes a lot of people, and blacks and whites would work together. The black people would come and, and help us. What would happen is in the community, the, the leaves get ripe from the bottom of the stalk up. And so it takes about six or seven weeks to gather a tobacco crop because the first week you gather the first three or four bottom leaves. And then the next week you gather the next three or four up the stalk and then the next week the next. And so you had people out in the field, teenage boys, young men, picking the tobacco and then bringing it, and then there was somebody with a sled, which was this long contraption that you load the tobacco leaves on, and bring it to the barn. And then at the barn, you have several people tying the tobacco onto <laughs> sticks, and you have uh, usually women or teenage girls, and you have handers handing the tobacco to them. Um, so you'd have probably 15 people to gather tobacco. So what the farmers would do is they would pick a day, they would get together and they would pick a day of the week and they say, okay, we're going to gather our tobacco on Monday and then you gather yours on Tuesday and you gather yours on Wednesday and then we will swap, swap help. Uh, so that's what happened. And black families and white families would work together gathering the tobacco. They would work together in the field and in the barn. Uh, but they didn't really socialize. You know, they, the work was one thing, the socializing was something completely different. And um, there was, um, when it came time to eat dinner, and dinner was the noon meal on the farm, uh, the white people, the, the mother of the house, the woman of the house, would cook a big meal for all the workers. And all the white people would come in the house and have dinner in the house. Uh, the black families would either go home and eat dinner at home, or if they were too far away or they didn't have anybody, if the black wife was, was working and there was nobody at home to cook, then they were fed outside. They, their meals were fixed and they were fed outside. You know, the table was set up in the yard or on the back porch or their plates were fixed and they sat down somewhere outside. Uh, they didn't eat together. And there's an essay called The Vertical Negro by a man named Harry Golden. Harry Golden was Jewish, he was from New York, but somehow he ended up owning and publishing a newspaper in Charlotte, North Carolina. And this was in the 50s and 60s. And when I was in college, and by that time I had developed a very strong 
sympathy for the civil rights movement, uh, but I remember reading this essay called The Vertical Negro that he it was published in the Charlotte newspaper and was reprinted all over the country. But his thesis, and he had observed segregation in the South, by, by that time he had been there for I don't know how long, a few years, is that in the South, as long as blacks and whites remained vertical, it was okay for them to to be together. They could shop in the same stores, they could walk the same streets, they could work together in the fields, they could, as long as both of them were vertical, they could associate with one another. The problem came when they sat down. They weren't allowed to sit down together. They couldn't sit down and eat together, they couldn't go to school together, they couldn't go in a restaurant together. Uh, they, if they went to a doctor, they had to be separate waiting rooms. Um, separate bathrooms. So his solution to the problem was that all we had to do to solve the problem is take out all the seats. Take out the seats on the buses, take out the desk at schools, take out the chairs in the restaurants, and just make everybody stand up. And as long as everybody's standing up, it's fine, and we can solve the whole problem of segregation. And of course, that you know, didn't get gain any traction in the South, but, but it was, I, I thought it was a very clever essay. And I was in college by the time this came out, this was in the 60s, and I just was really impressed with that. And I used that in the book. I have Kate remembering reading that essay in college because I remember reading it in college. And I remember writing a, a research paper for a, a class that I was taking about the civil rights movement, about segregation, and I had used that essay as one of the sources for the paper that I wrote. So, um, but one problem in the South, and all of you are aware of this, is that black men and white men could associate with one another. They worked together, they talked. Um, you know, it, it was fine for a black man and a white man to to associate and working together. I mean, of course, they didn't sit down and eat together or anything. And it was fine for a white woman and a black woman to talk to one another, to associate. The problem came is when you had a black man and a white woman. Uh, black men did not talk to white women. Uh, they did not if a white woman spoke to a black man, he didn't look her in the eye. He kept his head down. Um, and as, certainly, as you know, with Emmett Till, and you know from To Kill a Mockingbird, and you know from all the lynchings, that this was the biggest taboo in the South, was that white women and w black men just did not associate with one another. And this is still true, to some extent. M my father died about five years ago, and my mother was living alone in the house. She's in an assisted living facility now, but she lived alone in the house for several years after uh, my father died. And the black family that lived right down the road from us, and they were still there, so, uh, the, old, the, son, the oldest son in the family, who was about a year younger than I am, um, had moved away years and years ago, but he had recently come back and had moved back into the family home. And as long as my father was alive, he would come down to the house, and he and my father would talk, and they would them talk about the crops and the farming and, and whatever. Uh, but after he died, George uh, would not come to the house because my mother was there alone. And he told the rest of the family, I have several sisters that still live, live up there. He had told them, he said, if your mom ever needs anything, if there's an emergency, if she needs me, she knows where I am, she can call me. Uh, but he would not go there by himself with her there by himself by herself. And of course, if it had been an emergency or something, I guess he would have, but he would not drop by just for a visit because it just, it just, that doesn't happen still in the South. And that's still a big taboo. Um, but um, I really, by the time I was in junior high, in 1957, I was 13, uh, we bought our first TV set. My father bought with the tobacco money. Tobacco was the big money crop of, of the time. So uh, late August, early September, when the tobacco was sold, that's when we got the new car or the new TV or the new refrigerator or whatever. Um, so we bought a TV in 57. And that's when I really 
found out about the civil rights movement. Up to that point, I guess maybe I had heard about it, but I wasn't really aware of it to any great degree. And, but when I, we got the TV and I started watching the news and seeing the things that were happening, and most of them were happening in Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia and Arkansas, um, not a lot of news about Florida. There were a few things in, in Florida. There were some uh, in Tallahassee, there was the bus uh, boycott and uh, there were some, in, uh, some riots in Jacksonville and in St. Augustine, but I never saw any violence firsthand. I never experienced any, never saw any. Um, and, and that's not to say it didn't happen. I'm sure it did. I'm sure there were some incidents right there in Madison, but I never saw any myself. But, but I began to see uh, these things happening, and I began to really develop a great sympathy for the civil rights movement, and I began to see that segregation was not, the old separate but equal was not true, was not working. And I would say things at home to my parents, and my parents were both very staunch segregationists. And um, they you know, thought that I was going to get myself in terrible trouble for you know, even saying anything like this, but, but I, I really was, I was a very quiet child anyway. I was very shy, so I never really expressed my feelings in public. I never really did anything to um, help the civil rights movement. Um, and as an adult, you know, I look back on it and I think so many of us, uh, could have spoken up and should have spoken up, and we didn't, we were silent. Uh, and this is what happens in the novel with Kate. She, she had an opportunity to speak up and to do something to help Delia, and she fails, she's too afraid. She fails to take that opportunity. And it's only 45 years later when she's in her 60s that she really feels the need to make reparation for this failure. But, um, the, the people that I grew up with, the adults around me, all thought that our black people were satisfied. They were happy. It was the northern agitators who were coming in and causing all this trouble. But our, our people, they didn't want this. They didn't want integration any more than the whites did. They were fine the way it was. And this was their attitude, and this was what they truly believed. And they believed that the blacks were happy. Uh, because the blacks had never complained to them, of course not. <laughs> you know, uh, they wouldn't have said anything. And uh, and this was their attitude that it was all outsiders coming in and, and causing all of this. Um, so it was um, something that uh, I gradually came to to understand uh, what was happening and tried to rebel a little bit against my parents, but I guess I didn't really say too much. But um, my one experience with bucking the establishment, so to speak, um, was one summer, and I was probably 16, 17, I would have been a, probably a junior in high school. This was in the summer, between, probably between my junior and senior year. I was working in tobacco for my cousin, first cousin, Aaron, and he was a few years older than I was. He was newly married, and he was kind of liberal. His, his, my uncle, my mother, this is my mother's brother, was, was rather liberal for the times. He was one of the most liberal people I knew. And um, Aaron was gathering tobacco, and they had several white families working there, and they had a black family working there. And these were blacks that I didn't know because he lived several miles away. And, um, but uh, they had, when it came time for dinner, his wife had cooked dinner, and she, we had, you had to eat in stages because not everybody could fit at the table at one time. You had a first table. The men and boys would always be fed first. And then the table would be cleared off and the dishes washed, and then the, the women and, and girls would eat. And, um, and normally, like I said before, the blacks would eat outside or they would go home for dinner. But th for some reason, um, they decided 
that they were going to feed the black family inside the house. And, and so the wife, her name was Jimmy, J-I-M-M-I-E. Uh, and so Jimmy asked me, she said, um, she told me, we're, we're going to bring the, the blacks inside and, and feed them at the second table. And she said, will you stay and eat with me, with them? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll stay. So the first table ate, and my sister, about two and a half young, years younger than I was, was working there too. And my sister ate at the first table. So the whites all, they, everybody else ate at the first table. And then, and then they cleared off and washed. And then the second table, and they set the table again. And then Jimmy called them in and said, come on in, we're going to eat inside. And so Jimmy and I sat down to eat with, with them. And... That was a very awkward meal. Be not so much, not because Jimmy and I felt that awkward, but because the black family was scared to death. I mean, they were so frightened. I mean, they, har they wouldn't look at us. They hardly ate anything at all. And Jimmy would try to say, you know, you want some of this, you want some of that. And, and they just sat there and, and they were like frozen. And, and they, they ate a few bites, but they didn't eat very much. And it was just a very awkward situation. And I don't know, and I, I was afraid that my sister was going to tell on me. That was my, my only concern. I mean, I, the eating was fine, but I was afraid she was going to go home and tell my father. And if she had told my father, I don't know, he wouldn't have let me work over there again. And um, so I don't, I don't know what would have happened, but she didn't tell. She never told, and he never found out. And, but they never did that again. So I don't know why they didn't, I don't know if somebody said something to them or, or what, or if it was just the awkwardness of the situation, but that was the only time that they attempted it. But, but they were brave to do it, and, and I was, you know, fine with, you know, and now looking back, I'm, I'm glad that I did it. You know, I have one thing that I can say I did, but, but I wish I could have done a lot more. I wish I had done a lot more. Uh, but um, I remember when I moved to Titusville and started teaching, the schools, when I came to Titusville in 66, the schools were not integrated. They were still segregated in Brevard County. And they integrated, and I can't remember if it was the next year or the, if it was six, fall of 66 or fall of 67. It was, one, it was right, I don't remember, I think it was, do you know? Okay, yeah, I mean, it seems to me it was 67, but I remember we were there and we were told that we were going to be integrated, and I remember we had all these meetings, teacher meetings, to talk about our feelings and how we, would, how we were feel, going to feel about this and how we would react to certain situations, and all. it was just, you know, this really big, um, you know, pre preparation for integration that we all had to go through. But um, it, was, uh, it was a very different time. And uh, if you didn't live through it, it's, it's hard for Northerners to imagine what it was like. And I know we have some people here from the North, but um, it, the, the South was, was very, very different. Um, I'm going to run out of time here. I haven't even told you about the book. But the book is, uh, how many of you have read the book? Okay, we have, some of you have, if you haven't read the book. The book is completely, the uh, actions in the book are completely fictitious. The attitudes of the people, um, the setting, the way people treated one another are all very true. But the, the things that happened in the book are, are not true. But the story takes place in 2006. And the reason it's set that year is that's about the year that I started writing the book. So you can see about how long it took from the beginning to the end. And then it was published in last September in 2013. So it took quite a while to write the whole thing and then go back and revise it and, and all, the whole process. But uh, the story is about a woman from Titusville named Kate, Kate Raleigh. And she comes home, she goes home to North Florida 
to uh, take care of her mother. Her mother has fallen and dislocated her shoulder and has to have it immobilized for several weeks and she can't drive or can't use her right arm. So she, and, and Kate is a librarian in Titusville. I didn't want to make her an English teacher, but I didn't want to make her too far away from what I knew something about. And uh, so she's staying there for several weeks during the summer. She's off for the summer. And so it's, it works out well for her that she can stay up there and help her mother. And while she's there, immediately as the book begins, she runs into Delia. And Delia was the daughter of her father's sharecropper. Uh, and the, in this story, the sharecropping family lived right next to the, fam the what, Kate's family. Uh, the, Kate's father had built a little sharecropper's cabin across the lane from their house. And Kate and Delia, Katie and Delia were the same age, and they were in such close proximity that even though both sets of parents tried to keep them apart and not let them play together or socialize, uh, the two little girls found ways around it, and they found ways to, to get together and play together. And, and eventually, the, the father was off working in the fields, and the mother was a little bit more liberal than the father, and, and she felt sorry for Kate because there were no other little girls around for her to play with. And so the mother kind of, kind of allows things to, to happen. And so they play together until school starts. And once Kate goes to school, and then she realizes that playing with a little black playmate is not acceptable, and the kids, if the, if the other kids in her class find out about it, she's going to be ostracized. Uh, so at that point, she gives up. You know, she doesn't want to have anything more to do with Delia. And even though they see one another practically daily, they, they no longer socialize. They no longer talk to one another except just hello and any necessary conversation and, that they have. But, and then in... The 50s, when the civil rights movement begins, and Kate is watching TV and developing this social consciousness, she decides at that point to make friends with Delia, to let Delia know her feelings and that she is sympathizes with her and try to find out more about Delia and, and try to resume this friendship that had been destroyed for so many years. And, um, and she does have one encounter with Delia where she talks to her and tells her, sort of apologizes. But then right after that, there's an incident in the movie theater when Delia uh, comes into the movie theater with a friend and uh, asks to buy some uh, food from the concession stand. And then there's a scene with some boys that come in. And at that point, Kate has an opportunity to stand up for Delia and let these boys, these hoodlums who come in, know that she is there, that she sees what's going on, and she doesn't do it. She's, she's too frightened, she's, she's too afraid to, to step out and, and say something to make her presence known. And um, so something happens to Delia that night, and Kate is aware that something is going on, but she's not quite sure what, but uh, then, Delia moves away. Delia is taken away to Georgia to take care of a sick grandmother, is the, the family story. And she does not, and then she goes off to college, and she does not see Delia again for 45 years. And then when she goes home to take care of her mother, she runs into Delia. And at that point, her conscience begins to bother her, and she realizes that she has to do something to make reparation for this long-ago failure. And so at that point, she decides to uh, earn Delia's forgiveness by seeking justice for what happened. And that's mainly what the story is about, is how she seeks justice and what she does, how she and Delia come back together and work together in order to find justice and punish the villain of the story, Lonnie P. Ramsey, um, not for what he did for De to Delia, but for what he for another crime that was committed. Because Delia does not want her situation publicized, but um, but 
Kate finds out about another crime that uh, she begins to seek justice for. So I don't want to talk too long. I want to give you time to ask some questions if you have any uh, about me or the book or anything that you would like to know. One thing too that uh, Ben had mentioned and on, there is a warning on the back of the book about if you read the article in Tuesday's newspaper, I do use the N word. I could not have written the book without using the word. Uh, I could not have expressed what I wanted to express. And um, that was a word that I grew up hearing, and my parents used it, my grandparents used it, everybody around me used it. I did not realize that it was a derogatory word until I was, I don't know, probably 9, 10, 11, I don't know how old I was when I discovered that it was derogatory, that it wasn't just a descriptive term. But um, I hope I d didn't... Uh, offend anybody by its use, but uh, it certainly is not a word that I would use today, and uh, not a word that, uh, it, but it is a word you still hear in the South. Go back to Madison County, and, and you will hear that word. Uh, you will still hear it. Um, so, okay, questions? Yes. Well, this is actually, this is the third book that I've written. I have two other earlier novels that I had written that have not yet been published. And um, the first one is set in the same area uh, where I grew up. And then the second one is set during uh, the Vietnam era, it's set in 1970. It's about, uh, and they all have to do with the same family members. I don't know what prompted me to, this is a subject that I think every Southern writer gets around to eventually. And uh, certainly the first book that I wrote, all three of them have to do with social issues. The first one has to do with an illegitimate uh, a pregnancy out of marriage and the reaction of the family to, to it. And the, the second one I wrote had to do with Vietnam. And then this one, I don't know, it's just sort of a natural progression and it's something that I have always you know, wanted to write about. And um, like I said, to, it's sort of my apology uh, for myself and for all of us Southerners who uh, didn't speak up and stand up and, and do more uh, when we could have and we should have. Um, so I'm, I'm a great admirer of other Southern writers who've dealt with the same subject. Yeah. Did your family have slaves? Slaves? My ancestors? No, your mom and dad. What did you say? Oh, well, no, well, there were, no slavery was outlawed in, in 1865. In their home, no, no, we, uh, yeah, we did have working. Well, my father did have a sharecropper uh, who worked for him. And now, the sharecroppers, they had their own. They were responsible for their own crops. Okay, okay. The way sharecropping works is the the fam the the farmer. My father provided housing. Because when I was eight years old, my grandfather died, and we moved out of the house that we were living in and moved in with my grandmother to, so my grandmother wouldn't be alone. And then we had a vacant house. And that was when I was eight when my father hired the sharecropper to move into the house. But he was paid. Yeah, he, he lived in the house rent-free, and he had his own garden. He was paid a weekly salary, uh, not very much, but the main thing, the way the sharecropping works is that when the crops are sold, uh, he gets a share of the profit of, from the crop. So when the tobacco crop was sold, uh, he would get whatever percentage was, I don't know what it was, but uh, my father would get his percentage and then Robert would get his percentage. He would get a cut. And whenever the corn was sold, he would get a percentage and the watermelon, whatever was sold or whatever, you know, he worked on, did all. And um, it wasn't that he was working for my father. He was working with my father. I mean, my father worked just as hard as he did. It wasn't that my father was overseeing his work. 
my father, they were working together, but he would get a share of whatever was sold. Anytime something was sold, he would get a percentage of that amount. Yeah, Kirsten. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's what everybody tells me. They would tell me, oh, it's so suspenseful. I couldn't stop reading. I stayed up until midnight to finish reading your book. And no, I don't read suspense. Uh, I don't re really read mystery. I'm more, I was an English teacher for 30, over 30 years. Um, I'm more of a literary fiction type person. And when I started writing the book, I had no idea it was going to be suspenseful. I knew I was going to have these two little girls and I knew that there was going to be something that had come between them, and I knew that I wanted to bring them together again. And at that point, that's all I knew. And I didn't know what had happened between them. I didn't know why they, why Kate felt this need to, to bring, you know, become friends with Delia again. Um, so I, I, it really frightened me because I got to a point where you know it got suspenseful and I didn't know what to do and I said, oh gosh, I don't, I, I've never written, I don't read these books, I don't, and uh, but I belong to a writing critique group in Titusville, and fortunately um, I had some help, I had some other people uh, who could help me along and give me ideas and I said, oh no, what do I do now? And you know, they would throw out suggestions and, you know, well, why don't you do this and why don't you do that? And, and um, yeah, it, it really, at a certain point, I felt like, you know, it was getting to be too much for me. I never finished this thing because it was, it was turning into something that I hadn't intended it to be. But, uh, but I'm glad that people enjoy it and, and I'm glad that it keeps you, keeps you reading and to find out what happened. And, and I, you know, once I got, once I figured out my biggest problem was I knew that Kate was wanting to make reparation to Delia, but then once I realized, now Delia doesn't want this known. Delia doesn't want people to know what happened to her. This is not something she wants brought up into the public. And then I thought, well, now if, if, if we're not going to deal with what happened to Delia, now how am I going to punish Lonnie P? Um, with Delia not wanting it known. And so then once I came up with the idea of the arson, uh, of the other crime, you know, then it became easier. Then things began to sort of fall into place and, and said, oh, now I've got something I can, that they can get him for. But um, yeah, but there, it, I, my writing group really helped me out a lot with, with suggestions, yeah. Oh. I knew what segregation was, and I remember the night that Harry King Moore's house was burned mm -hmm. because I sent everything else, the black lips, you know, from one side of the street and the whites on the other. I stayed with the little black children <coughs> that were there, and it was time to go to first grade, and I thought I was so excited just because brother and junior and sister were all going to go to school mm -hmm. together. I remember brother telling me, we can't go to school together. And I said, why? He said, because you're white and I'm black. Yeah. And then, you know, we still played after school and during the summer. And I remember when he came and whispered me a secret that I couldn't tell anybody that he had heard his mom and his daddy talking about this great teacher who lived right there near us who was going to fix things so all of us kids could go to school together. Yeah. I remember, yeah, you know, the bombing, and I knew then that that was the man that was going to help me go to school with my friend. Mm -hmm. And I remember my parents laughing about it and thinking, well, you know, well, good, he's dead, and how can, how can a good man who wants to help people be dead? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was so vocal about it, they sent me out of town, because 
Because I was going to race the rocket. Oh, yeah. 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 The Moore, if you haven't been to the Moore Center up in MEMS, you really need to go up there and, and go through the museum. And the, the, uh, they rebuilt the home, uh, home place, the home that the Moores lived in. And you can go through the house and, um, yeah, and read all about it. But, yeah. 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 You'll have to follow up on it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, 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 yeah. Certainly, as an adult, yeah, she, she feels that she has to, yeah, go back and make make things right. Yeah, and with with Delia, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, certainly by that time, you know, I was certainly ready for integration, and I was, I was, uh, I, I never had a problem with, in my classroom, with, with integration. Um, you know, I, the biggest problem that we had at Jackson, and this was, junior, at that time, it was seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, and I guess there were there were some problems in the, with you know some fights and things, but the biggest problem, the biggest thing that I remember about those early days, is that there were some friendships formed between black boys and white girls, or generally that's what it was. It was a white girl and a black boy, and the parents were were very adamant about this is not going to happen and you have to watch out for it and you don't if you see these two together you have to separate them and that this is and I was the sponsor of the school newspaper at the time and we would have in the paper there would be these song dedications where you could you know dedicate a song from so and so to so and so and occasionally uh, somebody would send in a dedication and it would be a white girl dedicating a song to a black boy, and we had to make sure that that didn't get printed in the school newspaper because the parents would have a fit. And um, you know, that's the main problem that I remember from from those early days. That that was, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think a lot of liberal Southerners, you know, feel that guilt, you know, that we didn't do more, that we we could have, there were times when we could have and should have done more, and we just didn't do it out of fear or just out of cultural influences. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to go against your family and everybody around you, and, you know, you're getting this message from the majority and... And yeah, it's it's hard to sometimes stick up for your beliefs. Yeah, Juliet. Mm 
Yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, I think that's very true. Yeah, on, on, yeah. Okay. Are we run out of time or? Things have gotten a lot better, of course, uh, over the decades, but un unfortunately, just this morning on NPR, I heard an interview with a woman who has written an article for uh, Atlantic Monthly looking at uh, uh, segregation in, in a particular town in Alabama and following a family, three generations, where uh, the grandfather was uh, uh, just entering school after the Brown v. Board of Ed decision to integrate, and of course in the South, integrating with all deliberate speed meant decades uh, uh, in the South, and so he, even though he was born around that time, never went to an integrated school. His daughter did graduate. She went through uh, in, in a fully integrated school system, but then in the 90s when uh, the rules were relaxed for southern cities uh, regarding integration. Then uh, her daughter uh, is graduating from a high school that is 99% African American. So it, it, it's, it's really amazing that, you know, when you, a lot of us, I think, think a lot of these things were taken care of, you know, with, with, with laws in the 60s, and so many decisions are being made today to change things. Right. right, and yeah, it's it's a short. Sure. Well, well, integration was done in, incorrectly everywhere. There's all sorts of stories about how the best teachers were moved, you know, and uh, first, and and uh, the the way it was done was was not the right thing. Uh, like like so many uh, things where you're looking at a at a positive end result, getting there can be can be very difficult. But but it is alarming how. Uh, today, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Supreme Court decision about the Voting Rights Act. I mean, you know, we, again, we thought that was all taken care of, and now here we are uh, facing that again and, and uh, trying to exclude people from voting. It's just a, it's just a, a hor horrific thing. But anyway, I don't, I don't want, we could go on and on about that, but I, I want you to take time to uh, meet Ruth, and, and if you haven't read Reparation, you really should. I, for, I didn't mention in uh, the introduction that it won... Uh, the uh, Don Argo Award from the Space Coast Writers Guild and has been getting very positive reviews and is, is really an, an, an outstanding book. So if you haven't read it, I hope you'll pick up a copy and, and talk with Ruth and, and let's uh, thank Ruth for being here. Thank you. Ruth.